Shalom, everybody. Welcome to the third class here at the Jewish community of Sedona and the Verde Valley. I'm Rabbi Alicia Magal, and we're looking at various aspects of Kabbalah, which means receiving. And we're looking at what the meditators, the scholars, the sages understood about the mystery of life and how they expressed it. And they also tried to express things that they understood were beyond words. <laughs> and that couldn't really be taught, and then they would teach it. So it's, it's just very interesting how they kind of said, you can't do this, and now we're going to do it. Um, Anita, I'm going to have to ask you to turn your fan off because that is a distraction. Thank you. I was trying to figure out how I could just not Okay, see good. Uh, um. So in our first two classes, we looked at the breaking of the vessels, the idea of the, uh, the sort of the big bang, you know, the, the light coming forth, let there be light, and all of the um, understandings of Ma'aseb Bereshit. So we're going to review that a little bit, the working of creation. We looked at numbers, letters, pathways, um, numerology, and again, some way to say, what does this all mean? And how was it created? And what is our life all about? And how can we emulate the creativity of the Holy One in some small way? So uh, today we're going to look at one aspect. I'll review again, but we're going to look basically at one aspect of this, uh, the early teachings, which is Ma'ase Merkava, the chariot meditations. And we'll see, uh, we'll actually read from Ezekiel's vision from Ezekiel 1. So let me share. Uh, the vision of the Merkava, the throne, the chariot. Uh, and you'll see some depictions, as it were, of the Holy One, even though that can't happen. So there's this idea of wheels and rings and angels and light and a throne and sapphire blue heavenly colors we're going to be delving into all of those elements today so just uh to remind us where we left off we had um understood that after the expulsion from spain in the 15th century uh people moved to Sfat in the north of israel and they were up in the mountains in a Galilee region. And I'm sure that they were vortexes there. You know, like we say they're vortexes here in, uh, in Sedona. I think that is a vortex too. I just want to make sure I can see you all. I cannot. Um, and Rabbi Isaac Luria was called the lion, Ha'ari, the holy lion, Ha'ari HaKadosh. And he took many of the early teachings from the Sefer Yitzira, Sefer Baha, Bahir, and the Zohar was really where he focused. And his, his scribe, Chaim Vital, wrote a lot about it. And you can even see his uh, beautiful sanctuary and uh, synagogue that's open to tourists today. So in Lurianic Kabbalah, uh, they talked about the acts of creation the idea of breaking vessels from the primordial light, from emanation to manifestation, from the thought and the yearning to increasing physicality down to manifestation and the world of duality where we live. These pathways really interested him and they came to represent not just uh, increasing um, physicality, but actual midot, that is, traits, characteristics. And uh, we've been studying them through counting the Omer. This is the week of Hod, of, um, of, of Yesod. We went from Hod to Yesod, to foundation. And this is uh, intimate connection. And so each of the weeks we've been thinking, of what are these different traits? God created the world with them, and we create our world with them. Uh, much of the Lurianic Kabbalah has to do with corrective actions, that is tikkun. We often talk about tikkun olam. So this is tikkun repairing the broken vessels 
repairing what is broken in creation so that the sparks of light, these, this pathway of light uh, that is trapped in the vessels, the klipot, can be freed. And we do that by saying blessings, by being conscious, by keeping Shabbat, by all the things we do on the mitzvot, we're raising the sparks and we're taking everyday things like eating to a higher level. So today, what we're going to talk about is the Masse Merkava, the workings of the chariot. It comes from uh, first century, it's very early. And it's, uh, it, it represents the desire for close communication with God. So how do you get there from here? Let me just find my participants. For some reason, you've all disappeared and I can't see you and that's upsetting me a little bit. So I want to move this a little bit, see if it's there. I'm going to stop the share just for a second. And there you are. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you were all there. Everybody on mute and we'll go back to sharing. Okay. So in the Talmud, uh, it's discussed several times, but as a very powerful and dangerous and terrifying meditation based on the vision of Ezekiel, which we're going to read parts of today. It was a path through the upper world past seven palaces with armies of angels and rivers of fire. And it was thought that back at the time of the Torah, faithful Jews could communicate directly with God without risk. Very often we have, and so-and-so spoke to God, right? But the Kabbalists believed that contact with a force as vast and powerful as God could lead to madness. We've often quoted that the four went into paradise, into Pardes, and only one, Akiba, came out whole. So for this reason, Kabbalists really limited the study of Kabbalah to married men over 40 who had studied the Torah and the Talmud. In other words, they were grounded. <clears throat> and Masse Merkava also has physical risks because the mystics believed certain body positions could um, assure that meditators could have a glimpse of the throne, but those positions sometimes uh, could also lead to, to fainting or, or worse. So um, there was a danger, both physical, emotional, and spiritual. And mystics believed that visions had to be both emotional and physical experiences, but that they could overwhelm the soul and the body. So you had to be very, very careful, you had to be guided, and you had to be grounded. It wasn't just um, chanting or meditating and then saying, oh, wasn't that sweet. It was a real, a real experience, like a, like, a, like a trip, you know, it was really a trip. So while standing by a river in Babylon, Ezekiel saw a throne spinning in the heavens, accompanied by four winged creatures. And then there was some kind of shadowy figure that he says looked like a man, like it wasn't a man, but it looked something human seated on the throne, which is pretty shocking for us because we always think, oh, God has no shape, neither male nor female. But in this vision, there was something that appeared human to him. This came to be a description of the upper world of God removed from our reality here down on earth. So here is some of Ezekiel's vision. And I have looked and there are so many illustrations, just incredible about wheels and wheels and winged creatures and a burning sun in the heavens. And here's Ezekiel um, on the banks of the river having his vision. We'll see many more um, possible uh, illustrations. Um, so, um, Anita, I'd like you to uh, to start to read, and uh, you can just do the English. If there's something really interesting in the Hebrew, I'll point it out. And I looked, and behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with fire flashing up, so that a brightness was round about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of electrum, out of the midst of fire. And out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces, and every one of them had four wings. Thank you. What's so interesting is that in modern Israel, 
they had to make up words. And this is the word they used to say electricity, chashmal. So today, if you say, I plugged in something electric, you would use this word in modern Hebrew, but it comes from this Ezekiel's vision, the color of electrum, which I don't know what that means, but it was some kind of electrified, pulsating energy. So isn't that a great word to use for electricity in our world? Uh, and dmut means a kind of a figure. So everything is like kind of. When it says likeness in the translation, it means he says it was sort of like. Uh, I can't quite describe it. It was sort of like. So it was sort of like four figures. There was a lion and an ox and an eagle and a, a cherub or a man or a, a, a face of, that's human. There were wheels within wheels. And look how the artist described this sense of movement and fire and water and uh, sitting on a throne. And it, it formed kind of a chariot. It's very, very, uh, very creative ideas in this particular illustration. Here you have, again, the wheels within wheels and the winged creatures. You also have this kind of electricity of um, almost like halos, like something that's in orbit, something far away that's radiating. I mean, this must have been an incredible vision that he had. So we're going to go on. Diane Bouguet, would you read? And they had the hands of, of a man. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And as for the faces and wings of them, four. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. Each went straight forward. I want to stop you there. It's like they turned not. In other words, they didn't turn when they were going to go in one direction. They didn't turn in that direction. They kept facing forward. So it almost sounds mechanical, like some kind of a gyroscope or some kind of an unearthly vehicle that the wheels don't turn like usual. They face the same way, but they just zip, zip, zip. They go wherever they want. They can they can traverse the sky straight forward without turning. Go on. As for the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a man. And they four had the face of a lion on the right side. And they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four had also the face of an eagle. Go on. As for the likeness of the living creatures, <clears throat> their appearance was like coals of fire, burning like the appearance of torches. It flashed up and down among the living creatures, and there was brightness to the fire, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. So here you have the Ratsova Shove that we spoke about before, the running and returning, Rats is to run, Shove is to return, this kind of vibration of going and returning and flashing. So it's very hard to translate. So here it's the appearance of a flash of lightning, Bazak, yes. And he's trying to describe something he's never seen before. So he's using likenesses of what he has seen on earth but it's very unearthly. And this illustration kind of showed that there's winged creatures, there's kind of a, a glow, you can get the sense of movement that they're running and returning. And the whole thing is just extremely mystical. Uh, Patty, would you read? The appearance of the wheels and their work was like the color of a barrel yeah, you, you had a question? Here's a, here, here it is. <laughs> I looked <Girl>. it up. <laughs> and they had four, and they four had one likeness, and their appearance was like a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went toward their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for the rings, they were high, and they were dreadful. 
and they four had their rings full of eyes round about. Here's a contemporary illustration of Ezekiel looking up and seeing wheels within wheels and there were eyes all around. Now, could those have been lights within lights? It really looks very suspicious, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. What does this remind you of? UFOs. UFOs. Yes, and you're not the only ones who think he saw a UFO. I'm going to get right. into that later. So here he is, and the natural world is around him. Solid rock, trees, things that are recognizable, a river, and then all of a sudden, what? Wheels and wheels and winged creatures and strange lights? And he's, he's amazed, and there's a certain wind. You sort of feel that he's, there's a, a wind around him. Very strange. I love this one because it really illustrated the eyes. And there was this blue color that was crystalline and kind of uh, transparent up to a point with a, a kind of a blue tinge. This is beautifully described. Um, Sheila, are you there? Would you like to read this? Uh, and when the living creatures went, the wheels went hard by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the bottom, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the spirit was to go, so they went, and the wheels were lifted up beside them. So the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And from under the firmament were their wings, comfortable the one to the other. This one of them had two, this one of them had two which covered. And that one of them had two which covered their bodies. Thank you. So this is an illustration that, that was trying to understand what you were having trouble reading. <laughs> Each one had wings that two covered them, two were for, for, for flying, two were spread out, they touched, and the wheels were somehow behind them. And when it, the wheels went up, they went up. And there's another uh, verse that says, and their feet were extended, that they were like pointed. Now, I kept looking because it looked like a UFO to me. And I actually found there's a book called The Spaceships of Ezekiel by Joseph Blumrich. And on one of his covers, it says, was Earth once visited from outer space? Did alien beings walk our planet? A major NASA engineer reveals some astonishing facts. I thought we have to show this in Sedona. Uh, we really have to. Um, make sure that we understand that such a thing might have happened it might have been a meditation but it could have been a visit from outer space and that it was translated as angels and throne of god by by a prophet because that was his point of reference can i say something about the picture of ezekiel sure look, look, from the last slide look less like a human than the one that comes next where the beings look pretty human right well every artist has that right but uh, we know that they were actually um were they living creatures did they have different faces one said that they had uh, animal faces as well and the artist can do that he was he was more interested in the mechanics of the wheels and the floating upward that wherever mm -hmm. the wheels went these winged creatures or lights or eyes um, were following. Mm. Um, let's see. Uh, who else would like to read? I'll read. Okay. And above the firmament that was over their heads was likeness of a throne, and as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness as the appearance of a man above it, upon it, upon it above. Right, so uh, the translation's a little lumpy, but uh, this was likeness of a sapphire. So again, there's this crystalline blue, shiny essence, and there's an idea of a throne, and it kept, he keeps saying likeness of, likeness of, because it says ke, kedmut, he say demut it's like an image of it's it's the closest he can come to thinking what it was that they formed a throne and you can see how astonished he is 
And from his words, you can't quite tell what it was, except there was something that looked like wings, something that looked like blueness, something that looked like floating in the sky. And he saw a form, you know how, how everybody keeps naming the mountains here? Um, and uh, Pam, as you were reading, I was trying to imagine what is it like when you look at a formation of clouds or of mountains or of something in the sky? We try to make meaning of it, right? And so we give it names. Like we, we think one of the mountains looks like Moses and, and faces the synagogue. And there are all these names of things around. Well, that's what he was doing. He didn't just say they were shapes or it was vibrating. He tries to make sense of it. And so we make pictures out of it. Uh, another reader. You, you need to volunteer because I can't see you. Do you want me to call on people? Yes, please. Okay, Susan Burnett. For whatever reason, I still have the screen that has the stop all over it. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. Oh, she can't uh, see where we are, so call in someone else. Oh, okay. Um, Raya. And I saw as the color of electrum, as the appearance of fire round about and closing it, from the appearance of his loins and, on, and upward, and from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness round about him. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud of the, in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spoke. Thank you. So again, we have this chashmal, this uh, idea of something electric, something vibrating and bright and the appearance of fire. Here you have like electric fire in this illustration. And again, the winged creatures and the wheels within wheels and this separation, this idea that there's something separating that throne, something holding it up with clouds and that it looked a little bit like a rainbow. Mm. There was something of the colors of the spectrum in the sky. Uh, and the appearance of all of these felt like getting closer to the heavens, leaving the place of material reality and getting up to the heavens. And, and uh, this is what the your day hamir kavat those who were settling into the chariot that's what it called they were your day hamir kava were um practicing so they would meditate on this particular vision of ezekiel and they would feel like they were traversing those heavens they felt like they were coming closer to a place of pure energy and so this formed that um, that vision of focus for their meditation. Now, um, it became like other wonderful biblical passages, the focus of uh, spirituals and songs. So I wanted to play this for you. Ezekiel saw the wheel, way in the middle of the air. 
of the wheels in their work was like the color of barrel. And they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went, and when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. And upon the throne was the likeness of a man upon it. Well, as he gilts all the wheel of turn and pray. I just love that. There are many um, versions of this. There's Woody Guthrie and there's choirs, but I thought that was great because he also quotes part of uh, what we just saw. Now, he's not the only one um, who had a vision. Isaiah also had a vision of Seraphim and, and a throne. And if we read from Isaiah 6, above him stood the Seraphim, each had six wings. With two, he covered his face, with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. So there, again, there's that idea of many, many wings or many, many shoots of uh, some kind of feathery light that seem to go in all different directions. So this is a part of Isaiah. Um, so Isaiah was before the destruction of the temple. Jeremiah was during and after. But still, they had a very similar vision. In the year that King Uzziah, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two covered face, with two covered feet, with two did fly. And one called unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let me read it in Hebrew, and then you tell me where you've heard this. Vekara ze el zeve amar, kadosh, 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 Adonai tzvaot, melo ko haaretz kevodo. Let me stop the share there for a minute and see uh, if that sounded familiar to anyone. Let's hear. Yes, Patty? Well, we say it every Wednesday morning. It's part of the service in the Amida. In the Amida, so it's part of the Amida in the Kadusha, in the holiness part. And what do we do when we say Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh? We rise on our toes. You know why we do it? Because we're trying to be like the angels that we just studied. It comes from here. So next time you do Kadosh, 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 zip, you'll be back with Isaiah and. <laughs> And you'll realize where it comes from because remember the, the the prayer book is a cut and paste job from all parts of the bible and meditations of the rabbis and this this part comes from isaiah um, i once had to plot out all of the service and i had little lines going you know this is from psalms this is from proverbs and this is from isaiah and this is from exodus and and, and it really makes you understand how the, the prayer book is put together to take us through the four worlds and bring us back down to earth. It's a, it's a journey that we take. And if you meditate on each part, if you really get into the different prayers, you actually rise up. That's why we do so much standing, you know? You're actually going to, a, to, to the fourth world and coming back down. Now, it doesn't happen each time, every time, all the time, but it's created and choreographed to enable us to do that. Um, before I show you the next slide, I would like to get some reactions to uh, the vision and some of the illustrations and perhaps how you imagine it in your own in your own mind. And we can go back to some of the slides. Uh, it's it, it just 
is so powerful. And you can imagine that from the time of the first, second century in, into the Talmud, which spans all the way to about the sixth century, and then going even later to the Kabbalists in the 16th century, um, they would use the earlier visions for their own meditations and add whatever they were learning in their own philosophy and their own experience, uh, whatever was happening in their world would also enter in. And so it, it kept growing and becoming deeper and deeper. And especially the Lurianic Kabbalists had all of this literature to look at. They also had all the commentary from the Talmud about it. They also knew the dangers of it. They, they had read all the stories about others who had done meditations. And so they had schools of, of, um, of Kabbalah and they would make sure that you were guided. And then there were all these rules that you, you couldn't actually explain it all, but you had to wait till the student intuited it and hinted that they were hungry to learn it. And then you would give hints. And in the Zohar, there are also just hints. And it says, the one who understands will understand. So let's see what you understood from all of that, what you took and maybe what it, um, what it touched in you. Every once in a while, you'll have a phrase or a word and you go, oh, and what's the oh? I'd like to know what piqued your interest in, in, in the vision or in um, any of the illustrations. Pam? The wheels within wheels and the wings and wings and going in different directions, but always going straight. And what was different within all of that? An ox. How did that ox fit in there? Everything else is moving and flying. And there's this ox, I guess, to keep you grounded. <laughs> well, it was also the different faces. And, and um, Isaiah also has different uh, animal faces. So there was an eagle, an ox, uh, eagle, an ox, a, a face of a person. A lion. lion. And a lion, right? So there, there are um, essences of these animals that perhaps were meant to hint at something else, like power and strength and flight and humanity and who knows. Uh, again, it's a meditation and it's, it's a flight of fantasy. And it's trying to make meaning Imagine if you looked in the sky, and you just saw whirling, swirling lights and things. You went, it was like, it was like a gyroscope. It was like, it was like something that you had seen. So they were talking about something they could understand, and they were people who had seen animals in the field. So maybe the the faces looked like animals. Yes, uh, Sheila. Oh, I actually didn't have my hand up. <laughs> this is like an auction. You bought it. Okay. <laughs> so. I've had two friends who, women who had not, were not 60 at the time at all. They probably were somewhere in their 30s and 40s, very different women who, very psychic, I wouldn't have used those words then, very in touch. And they said they saw way, way, way into the future and it scared them to death. And they didn't want to talk about it except with each other because each knew the other had been that far, that far into the whatever. Um, so not, it, it's like the way back then they saw the COVID and all the, all, all the, the the destruction the 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 death the um and so they didn't want to talk about it they weren't sure they could even handle it which explains uh, i think to me why or the the reasoning behind until you're 60 um, and male males they, they actually said 40 which was like today 40 thank you <laughs> 40 is the old 60. Yeah, um, as if men could handle it better than women, or men could handle it, women couldn't. We weren't, women weren't to know. Um, so all these, uh, everything you've said today has been just 
so expansive and enlightening. And what I want to keep doing is, is making sense out of it. Uh, which you're, explains you're reminding, the pictures. You're reminding me of uh, Jacob on his deathbed when he uh, he's about to tell them of the time to come, and an angel stops his mouth because you're not supposed to tell. And so it, it, there's a there's a like a blip uh, in the Bible. There's a non sequitur, and then he does something else. Then he blesses them, but he never says what he was going to say because of that uh, that impossibility of sharing what will happen in the time to come. Uh, and, and yet the yearning to know, yes. we're, always, we're always looking at, I don't know, horoscopes and, and <laughs> you know, all kinds of means to, and we don't take it all that seriously. And yet we really like to know what would happen. I told you sometimes that when I was 14, I wrote a, a letter to myself that to be opened in 50 years. And wow. it, it was full of questions and I found it. And it said, um, where do you live? And did you marry? And do you have children? And are you happy? And what do you do? And it was a sweet little teenage handwriting. And I was going, sweetheart, it turns out OK. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but uh, you know, you can't open the letter till it's time. Um, and so there were two strains of Kabbalah. One was to understand the works of creation. And one was to connect with the Holy One and to transcend our uh, our earth, our everyday living. And there was also the practical stream of Kabbalah of how to apply it. If you know the permutations of the name of God, if you chant it just right, you can bring rain like Honi Hama Agel. You could stop a plague. You could affect a difference because you were so um connected and so there was a purpose to it and there was a kind of um well a kind of guidance that you would go to someone that powerful and say intercede for me help me um my wife is infertile my crops haven't come out uh, it hasn't rained or whatever the thing is and they would go into these trances and affect a difference so below as above so above as below they would do something theurgic which means to influence the the holy creator and bring down something and, and align ourselves with the with the will that would create change so it was it was very um scary and if you weren't grounded you could you could flip out like your friends were loath to talk about it. They didn't say, oh, I had a very interesting experience today. Let me tell you about it. They went, whoa, I'm not going there because you're stepping beyond a boundary yeah, that, yeah. um, that, that sci-fi tries to do in the movies where you sort of go through that lens and all of a sudden you're in a different world. Um, it pulls at us and it repels us. Um, and it fascinates us yeah. and it tantalizes us and we're really interested and yet we're hesitant. So all that push pull, that rots for shove is evident now. And I mean, I've had um, three experiences like that. And the first time I had no idea what was happening and I needed help getting back. The second time I reveled in it and just yeah. chanted. And the third time I felt like my vessel was very strong and that I could actually, uh, if I had, I, I could have guided people there. It was a very different feeling. But I'll never forget that first time, like, what is happening? I was out of body and chanting the, the letters and the vowels of the name of God, just like they said to do. And, and at the end of that whole session, um, David and Shoshana Cooper, David wrote, God is a verb. Is that David Cooper? And uh, he and his wife said to me, Alicia, your first time out, you went to a place where people spend their whole lives trying to get to. Mm -hmm. Now you can only do grounding meditations. And I did grounding meditations for the next 11 years. It's, it's real. It's serious. Now, there are many Kabbalistic um, 
activities and attitudes and liturgies that we do now. I'm going to just show you a couple of them. And here they are. Um, we sing Le Chadodi, very different melodies. Le Chadodi, that's Anita's one, or Le Chadodi, they're all different melodies, but it comes from the Kabbalat Shabbat by Alkabetz in Tzfat, and uh, because they felt that Shabbat was more than just a day of rest, it's a gateway for reaching expanded consciousness. So we're welcoming the Sabbath bride. Let me tell you more about this. I have a picture here of as it were the Sabbath bride and um, so just look at that as I'm telling you more about what Lurianic Kabbalah teaches us about um, Shabbat after the Friday afternoon service so we're trying to welcome the Shabbat how did they do it they would go to the fields so it wasn't the wilderness and it wasn't the city it was in between and it was based on the mystical concept that the holiness of Shabbat had the power to elevate elements of creation itself beyond what was inherently holy, that, that everything could just be elevated. Like, it's a mitzvah to enjoy food and drink on Shabbat because we're utilizing the power of Shabbat to sanctify those aspects of physicality, like we're raising the sparks, right? So we could leave the security of the town, civilization, a place that's settled by the forces of or order and harmony, and we could experience and draw holiness out there and bring it back. Um, so we would turn away from where we usually pray. So usually we pray facing east, right? But we turn to the west, we turn to the door, we turn to the other side to greet the feminine archetype of the divine presence as she turns to face us, Shekhinah. And we believe that on Shabbat there is a cosmic union of spiritual forces, the masculine, the feminine, the heavenly, the earthly. And so when we turn to say, come my bride, boi kala, boi kala, it's, um, it's, it's, the, it's really the Kabbalistic understanding that during our regular weekdays, the mystical, masculine, and feminine forces are like back to back. They, they're not together. If, if you know the, um, the Kabbalistic expression, it's Ze'er on Pin is the masculine and Nukva is the feminine. But at those times, the masculine is to the east and the feminine, the divine presence, Shekhinah, is in the west facing the other way. Ah, but as Shabbat approaches, we, in the role of the masculine in a way, turn west to greet the feminine archetype of the divine presence and she turns to face us resulting in a cosmic union of spiritual forces, and we are now aligned. So next time I say, and now we rise and face the door, I think it'll have a lot more meaning to you. We're actually bringing in Shabbat bride, and it's like this holy union and Shabbat, and we are then going to be expanded and sort of larger than we were. Now in Havdalah, we have a Melave Malka, which means to accompany the queen. You accompany the Sabbath queen at the end, like when a a guest comes, you greet them. Well, you, you don't just let them walk out the door. You also uh, accompany them when they leave. So that's what we're doing with the Shabbat bride. Here's Melave Malka. Usually it's with music. It's with a table of uh, goodies and um, talks of Torah. It's, it's a, a lovely afternoon and evening thing that goes together with um, the Melave Malka by saying goodbye to Shabbat with spices to revive us because that extra soul leaves us and also some sweetness from Shabbat we want to keep and a wine and um, and the the braided candle uh, and these are also mystical symbols that allow us to say goodbye to Shabbat um, those of you who came to my Tu B'Shvat Seder I used to do it with the children at the school uh, it's a four worlds experience we had white grape juice going to pink we sort of went through rosé you know and up through the full red um, in a way that was bringing from the ethereal down to the full blossoming the full summer from winter to summer but it was also going through the four worlds and we also had different kinds of fruits first we had those that 
had a hard clipa, a hard husk, and then some that were soft, and some that you could eat completely like a strawberry or a grape. And uh, again, we were going through various realms of accessibility. Where are you more removed? Where are you closer? So the Tubishvat Seder was developed by the Kabbalists in the 16th century, and uh, one form of it we do today. At Sukkot, when we wave the lulav and the etrog together and we chant in all directions, we're bringing in those forces of heaven and earth and east and west and north and south and making a kind of unification of things that are very different. None of those plants ever grew together. They're in all different places. We're bringing them together. The idea of unification is a very Kabbalistic kind of um, expression of yearning because we live in a dualistic world. I'm going to stop the share again. This, this is so shamanic. You, you know, the last part of what you're saying, um, so many, I, I don't know how many, but you, you know, there's, there is a man who kind of did a generic shamanism kind of thing, teaching and, and with the different teachers that I've studied with, um, doing prayers to the four directions, sometimes it's the seven, it's above and below and the within space, um, shape shifting into different animals. Um, you, you know, the, all, all the like lights and colors, I, I know not so much from shamanism, but just, it's not my personal experience, but I've had people that I've worked on as a body worker, you know, for the first time, see angels, see, see different colors for the first times, um, you, you know, certainly read about, you know, any number of people's experiences of these. So to me, they're not very far out experiences um, in, in that, um, you know, I, I think there are these mystical realms like you were talking about that are accessible. And I'm wondering, um, well, I don't know if you can see this, but I, I found this card from the Tarot because the number seven card in the major arcana, um, they actually have the Hebrew letter Chet on here and it's a chariot with the four winged animals. Oops, let me see. If... We could see it better if you didn't have the background. Yeah. Where do you I, think I, they got it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it, it, I mean, it's totally, it's, it, it's directly from this. Um, you would have to get rid of your background, but not. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm doing. That's OK. Uh, it's very interesting when you find something like that, bring it closer. OK, four directions, a chariot, uh, the four animals, um, wheels and wheels. Somebody's been reading Ezekiel. <laughs> right? It, it's like directly. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Um, I think that if people meditate, and especially if they do um, fasting, and if they are very in tune with their bodies and with nature, they will come up with similar understandings of the connection of those realms of which you speak. And so I imagine that there was a lot of cross pollination with other mystics. And that the mystics, the Sufis, you know, the, the mystical edge of all the religions, they can talk to each other. Yeah. It's the other end, the, the, uh, the more rigid end of this is the only true religion. They, they can't talk to anybody else. <laughs> and, um, and they will be uh, uncomfortable with any flexibility. So I think there's, there's a, a mystic edge to every religion. And there's a kind of a rigid orthodoxy, to use that word, where the boundaries are very clear and the, the customs are clear and the dress is clear. And um, you, you just don't, you don't step outside of that and everybody else is going to hell. And that's not where I live. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I can talk to someone on the liberal or mystical end of any religion more easily than the orthodoxy of my own religion. So we, are, we are, yeah. Are you going to go into the Merkaba more? Because there are a lot of people teaching like Merkaba 
I don't know a lot, but there are people, one of the main guys used to live here, John Loma Kizadek had a Merkaba meditation. That would be very interesting to find out what how they're using it today. I wanted to give you the basis of it. And so the Merkava meditation, Merkava means chariot. It also happens to be the name of the Israeli tank. Hi. So the Merkava is one of the names of the of the most modern tanks in Israel. Um, it's based on this and, and to try to, it's called your Deha Merkava because you have to sit into, you have to sink into it. You're sort of like in the pocket. Uh, so I always thought, why isn't it the ascending people? But no, it's called your day, the ones who go down into the chariot. It always interested me. I'd love to know how it's being adapted and used in today's teaching of the Merkava. Uh, but at least I wanted you to have the, the, the biblical basis of it and to know how it was used in, um, in, in Kabbalah that is part of our tradition. Now, if you grew up in reform or conservative Judaism, you did not hear about this because we were trying to be in the 50s and 60s and until let's say the 70s, um, politely like our neighbors and um, very invested in the holiday transference of meaning, the liturgical transference of uh, being capable of reading the Hebrew and knowing the order of service, but this wasn't talked about. And in the Chavura movement that started in the 60s and 70s and with Reb Zalman of Blessed Memory and uh, Shlomo Karlobach and it, it just, and all, and so many Jews who went into Buddhism and ashrams and went to study in other um, disciplines, TM and, and all kinds of meditations, uh, they were slowly starting to chant the Shema and they would start coming back and they were being reintroduced to that strain of Judaism that has been there all along. It's, it's so ancient, but it had been sidelined a little bit. And um, Reb Zalman, uh, in, in this renewal movement, that's what it's been called, said, you have it in your own tradition bring the Sufi dance, bring the meditation, bring the chanting, bring that all back and let's do it in a Jewish context. And so that is why I wanted to show this, not to be like those pop stars that say, um, oh yeah, give me the red string. Oh, sure, let me run my hand over the book. No, I wanted you to know how deeply involved our people have always been with being literate so that they could connect with holiness, with the works of creation. And so we could emulate, I, I, I don't want to say emulate God, but emulate that creative flowing energy that is the higher power. As a matter of fact, the name that we cannot pronounce is really four letters, Yud, He, Vav, He. And if you pronounce it without the vowels, because there aren't any in the Torah, it would sound like your breath. So with every breath, you're actually uh, praising God, uh, connecting with God. And that's why the breath meditations are so powerful. If you add the vowels, you're getting into all the different creative aspects and possibilities and permutations of that creativity. If you look at from Keter all the way down to Malchut on the tree of life, you're trying to replicate that energy that goes from the yearning to the physical to the actual. And we do that all the time. I mean, when Patty is doing her, her jewelry and, and when Pam is, is doing her work and everybody here, if you write poetry, if you put together anything mechanical, if you plant a garden, it's the same creative act. Whoosh, but it starts with wanting, thinking, planning, gathering, and then having it actually manifest. Um, there, and that is why it was so dangerous to the more uh, rigid elements in history, the Catholic Church or Wahhabi Islam or Orthodox Judaism, that any other kind of books would be considered heresy and blasphemous and they had to be 
either ignored or burned or or somehow shut out because it was too dangerous to let in other ideas. We live in an age where we want to have many ideas and we want to pick and choose what we feel the truth is. And hopefully there's there's a way to guide our path so that we can get through all of the noise because there's so much now, there's so much information to get to some kind of path of righteousness and justice and compassion and all of these wonderful midot, all these qualities that we want to emulate. Um, I know that two of you have to leave at four, so I kind of went a little bit faster so we could actually have the conversation and be all together uh, at this time. Uh, it's terrible to leave. <laughs> That's I okay. I don't no, want to, but no way. I have an appointment, so. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. So the vessel of creation is also woman. I'm leaving with that thought. Uh, I'll talk to you later, Sheila. Bye -bye. Yeah. It'll be recorded, Sheila. Uh, Nancy, thank you for joining us. There we can see you. How are you feeling? Hi. I, I'm, I, I can barely talk, actually. <laughs> so I I feel like it's more about I don't I, what do I know I don't know anything but what I'm thinking is it's more about being found so it talks to you I don't know I, I I'm all I'm all bachotted but I, that that's a you know my son is named Ezekiel oh I did not know that so thank you, but I but I'm I'm trying to pro this is this is a lot and it's big, but I feel like something like you have to be uh, my my computer is is didn't have energy, which is why I turned off the camera to try and let it. Um, but but I feel like it's it you've got to be, it's got to pick you to to speak with you. L like you said, you had three experiences and and you know. So we have to do the best we can and 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 do and learn and be and do and you know exactly and in ancient times there was a lot less uh, knowledge to impart you could actually learn a few hundred years ago you could actually learn all the learning there was we can't do that anymore we're all specialized but if you took time to meditate and to delve into the mysteries and you were doing the mitzvot and you were eating kosher and you were observing Shabbat and you were in a community that supported all of this, you could rise to some heights. You could have an inkling of a twinkling of a moment of rising to heights where you saw this, or it was a UFO. <laughs> who knows? But I was not the first one who listened to this description and thought wheels and wheels with lights it, like eyes and it, and it moved quickly wherever it wanted without having to turn this sounds like some you know a visitation from another planet yes anita in terms of the whole not just ezekiel's wheels and wings and stuff but imagine fire was not hot did not burn you so you were able to try to grab it and obviously you can't grab it. And it's kind of like those dreams, some dreams you have and you can explain everything in the dream. Everything is very clear, but most of our dreams, at least my dreams are just so fluffy that they just kind of disappear. And that's kind of like how I feel in my life right now that I'm just not able to, you know, I keep looking for some answer. I, I was, and I keep thinking about Rivka when she was pregnant with Yosef and Yaakov, and she said, "In Cain, Lama, Lama Zanochi. Yeah. If so, so why it am I? It's gonna be like this. Why do I exist? And it's just so fluffy, so intangible, so out of reach for me. Well, you've also been isolated for a really long time. Most. Oh, and so has Susan. So is Susan. And so is Pam, actually. And and some of uh, Araya, too. And um, we're just starting to get out, and every little thing feels like a really big deal. Well, 
some of you are getting out. Yeah, some of us are getting out and we're appreciating it so much because it's been so unreal. Yes, Nancy. Well, I mean, of all the people to say, why do you exist? Anita, we need you. Like, you don't even think like that. We need you. you. You give us our materials. You have such good contributions to this class. Like, just stay here. <laughs> but, right. but, so, I'm looking for some inner meaning. So yeah. thank you, thank you, Nancy. I appreciate. Well, I have that. to say that uh, Anita's wearing a shirt that says "Abracadabra," which, <laughs> which means I, I create as I speak. So it's perfect for this class. Um, there's where, a certain magic that, element here. Where uh, is that community? Where is that community that you it supports you to meditate, and read Torah, and do? Where where is this place? Like camp. 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 Camp Ramah. Um, it, it could be camp. It could be uh, a kibbutz. Really? Or it could just be a, a synagogue community where you come and you drop in and then you leave. Hopefully our synagogue has some elements of that, even though we don't live all together. But that's why you need to come together, whether it's on Zoom or in person, on a regular basis. That's what Shabbat is all about. I think Shabbat is... Um, it's considered a corridor to the world to come. Imagine that you are on, in a corridor with windows and the Garden of Eden is outside and every Shabbat is another window where you get to peek at the Garden of Eden, kind of like that. <laughs> and so, what, about, what about the possibility for those on Zoom for Shabbat that they could stay on after the service and be able to have some sort of communion with each other. That's a very good idea. I will ask if that is possible and just leave, you mean leave the camera on and leave. Uh, yeah, just leave the Zoom room open, yeah. Leave the Zoom well, room open. Of course, we all leave within about 10 minutes, but maybe we could do that for about 10 minutes. I will ask. Thank you. I think that's. Well, I mean, it's longer if you're going to be doing ONEGs and stuff. Right, right, right. If once we start doing Onyx. So I'm just going to ask, leave the Zoom room open and people could talk. We don't even need someone operating it, right? On Shabbat. Because we're all yearning for that connection and we're all asking ourselves at one time or another, Lama Anochi, why am I here? What is my sole purpose? And it can get difficult. I was just talking to Eve Ilson a few minutes ago. She's the widow of Reb Zalman and we went to college together and you know we, we knew each other's parents and all that and she was saying everything feels odd it feels like we're looking at the world through a mesh kind of a fence right now it doesn't feel regular it feels odd and so i imagine that we're all feeling a little off and a little odd and a little removed and so meditation of something concrete meditation on the shema listen get it everything is one, or coming to our meditation class and doing the breathing together, or anything that you could do that is an elevated form of unification and connection would be helpful during these very odd times where we're not looking at the world in the same way. I, I, have you felt like that? Because I certainly have. Yeah, I love that image of the veil. And uh, it's just kind of reminds me of when I was in Netanya with my brother and it's, you know, Friday night and he was ushered up in front and I was behind the mechitza where you could barely see anything. Uh, and it's that kind of veil, but uh, Friday night at services, I just really kind of lost it again because I was just thinking, I don't know when, if I'll be able to get back in the synagogue. Well, pray it will happen. And if not, I'll come sing outside your window. <laughs> and bring me muffins. <laughs> I'll bring you more muffins, yes. Uh, Nancy, you had your hand up? I, I don't know if other people are feeling this, but I'm in this phase where, you know, when you, when you get out and you do see people, I'm scared of everybody. It's like, you don't want anyone to come near you. You don't want anyone to talk to you. Like, God forbid somebody comes near you. Exactly. It's like... It's like, you know, like the only thing worse than being home is being out and walking around being even more scared, which we do have to be. There's, you know, so Anita, you know, we're in, we're in this for a while. So 
but but this is so safe. This is so safe and and so real. What Zoom? <laughs> Zoom is safe, right? Zoom and I'm reaching all of you. But let's just reach out and reach out to each other for a minute and just all be connected. Yes, this is uh, this is how we can do it. Good. Not quite the same as having physical contact with someone. No, but at least you know that we care and that we're all connected in some way. Um, I want to go back to sharing and for the end of our um, our time together, I really wanted to have a meditation again on this Ratzvashov, the electrical colors, and just take it for yourself. Uh, we'll do it for about five minutes and then we'll come back. able to uh, bring it down slowly, but please uh, take your moment to blink and move your shoulders and come back to the room. We have entered realms, I would say we've dipped a toe in the sea. And I'm wondering which aspects you would like to explore for our last class next week. We've looked at the letters, the numbers, the pathways, the light, the klipot, some of the meditation focus, um, biblical verses. Uh, is there one particular avenue that you would like to explore more for our last class together? 
Yes, Anita. The meaning of life. <laughs> Just a small chunk of knowledge there. Uh, any other aspects that we touched upon that you'd like to go into more deeply or any other thing that you have studied on your own that you that has, hasn't been touched on because there's many aspects of of um, of Kabbalah if you want to do more of the Zohar if you want to study a passage if you whatever strikes you yes Raya I I'm wondering in, in light of what Anita said um, I've just recently been part of a another spiritual group that works um, in part with inquiry and, and she's doing it what she calls a holistic way and I'm wondering if this is rooted also in Judaism because I imagine it is where usually in pairs um, let's say I would ask Nita what is the meaning of life and she would say something and I would say thank you and we would keep going for like 12 minutes, 15 minutes, 20, you know, just repeating, 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 you know, allowing someone to go deeper and deeper into their own experiences and wisdom around those kinds of, you know, really deep questions. Thank you. I'll consider that as part of it. Thank you. Rabbi, you mentioned interpreting like taking a verse or something and interpreting that. I'd like that a lot. We could do that with um, with Torah portion Yitro or, or one portion and, and we could uh, take it to where the Zohar leads us, where it's all symbolic and it's way beyond the, the story. Um, as I've been studying with Danny Matt, it's been, <laughs> Uh, it's like traveling on a new route where you thought you knew the road, but you're seeing it in a whole different way. So um, I'll consider that too. Pam likes that idea. Diane likes that idea. Susan. Um, I, I feel so drawn all the time to the idea of water. And the men. Can you get um, closer? I can't hear you very well. Um, I feel drawn all the time, like it's in the meditation, um, when you're talking about the men and water, it's almost like during the meditation, I'm actually being taken and melted in, re-melted, sort of, I don't know how to describe this, into the water. So that, it, and it's reminded me of something I came across recently that the Shemayim is sometimes Kabbalistically known as the mixture of fire and water. And I, I would love to explore that a little bit more. The elements themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to give this some, some thought because up to now I've been telling you a little bit about the sort of the building blocks and the foundations, but where does it take us and how do we apply it and how does it help us in our lives and how does it help us answer our big questions? That, that is why we would like to know more about it, right? Patty. On that note, I, I've just been thinking through this whole class about how it's about acceptance of things, how they are, rather than changing things, getting into the flow, understanding all the aspects in order to get into the flow of the right now and how as above, so below, you know, as heaven reflects earth, earth reflects heaven, it's all one. Not about manipulating, but acceptance. That's a very um, beautiful way of receiving. So we all receive through our own senses and our vessel, which colors, just like colored glass, takes the light and changes it. And uh, so how we interpret and how we take it in, uh, it's very 
personal and it's unique. So Kabbalah means the receiving. Uh, I would suggest Tirza Firestone's book on the receiving a wonderful um, sort of biography, but also about Kabbalah and uh, how she grew up as an Orthodox young person and then how she kind of left and how she was one of my mentors in the renewal movement. Um, we have it in our library as well. So perhaps you could also read something for next time about Kabbalah. And I don't care what it is. There's a, a book called Practical Kabbalah. There's a book called, uh, I don't know, um, Kabbalah for Dummies. I mean, you know, there's, and then there's a Zohar and there's Bahir. There's all these different books that are either primary or secondary resources. I'd like you to read something and come out of it with a question and a statement. Something that you're asking and something that from your reading you can proclaim, that you can say with a period at the end of the sentence. And we're going to share that at the very beginning and see where it takes us, OK? Yes, Nancy? I have a hard time. You know, like when you get into the Omer, I have a hard time doing anything. Like, how do you do more? Like, you know, how do you have time for more when you're really delving in? Or is, or could I, what? Well, first of all, you have to get quiet and calm down. Hmm. And you have to say, uh, I have time for this. So you sit in the pocket of what is this day and what is this week? This is the week of Yesod. What are my foundations? What do I really believe? How do I connect most deeply? And what is this day? Oh, well, it's Tiferet, it's the harmony, heart space, balance place. So am I balanced within my foundation? And you ask yourself the question, where am I not in balance? Where am I? Could I be? Is this a goal of mine? Now that took maybe 12 seconds, but I went somewhere when I was speaking to you. And you just do that every day. Because if you yearn for it, you will manifest it in the physical world. And just like that flash of, of light that goes, it, it takes but a second. So time is not the issue because when you focus on a path, you're instantly there. And I know this to be true. Hmm. So have a beautiful week, everyone. We'll see you next week, and maybe we'll see you before that, um, Torah study. And um, please check our website because I'll Minion be tomorrow. Minion tomorrow at 8.30. We need people. Please come. And uh, Torah study Friday night, all, all the regular things. But you know, Shavuot is coming, and I want each one of you to come to either the virtual sh Shavuot of the Phoenix area um, or in person, our evening of, of, of study, of which one section will be virtual. The 8.30 to 9.10 will be virtual, and it'll be broadcast and shared with, with the rest of the Phoenix evening that goes from 7 to midnight. So. Wherever you are, whatever you can do, please be part of an evening of study. It'll be mystical and interesting. And uh, that'll be Saturday night, June 4th. The other thing that I want to tell you about is that on, well, I'll send out, I'll send out a notice, but I'll be doing something with Siona Benjamin, who's a Indian Jewish artist. I mean, from India. Extraordinary. And it'll be about Balotecha, Miriam and uh, Tsipora. And she's done the most incredible animation that we were, we've been working on it for almost a year. Uh, and so I'll let you know about that because it'll be virtual and I'd like you to see that. It'll be June, I don't know exactly. I think, I think it'll be the 12th, but I'm not sure, 13th, uh, 13th. Uh, 4 p.m. our time.
it, it's with the Amen Institute. And uh, since you're all on my emails, you'll be getting notification of that. Uh, so I'm doing a lot of very interesting reaching out work with other artists and rabbis and studies. And I want to share as much as I can with you. And you'll get out of it as much as you bring to it. So I want you to bring something for next time. I want you to have almost an offering of a question and a statement that has something to do with some aspect of Kabbalah. Oh, this is going to be good. Is that statement going to be an answer to the question? Does not have to be. OK. It does not have to be. It, it, it could be um, the answer to this I know to be true, colon. Mm. <laughs> Or this I have found that fascinates me. But I want something that ends with a period, something that ends with a question mark. Are we supposed to answer the questions that each of us are going to ask? You do not need to answer. If it's a good enough question, it'll just float there and just be beautiful in itself. All right. <laughs> all right. Shalom, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank Bless you. you all. Bye-bye. Thank you for these classes. It's great to have the mysticism come out.